21st century has killed some of our favorite car brands and most of our dreams. Today we're gonna look at every automaker that has died this century. Everything from Saab to Pontiac. Why did these car companies fail? And did they deserve it? Well, let's find out. Welcome to Donut. Dude, <laughs> this is a pure sports car experience. Yeah, kind of peppy, honestly. Hey, welcome to Donut! At the beginning of this century, the US reigned supreme as the world's top automaker, thanks in large part to the fact that this country is pretty much designed around cars and the fact that everybody has one. It's kind of a problem. Yeah, <laughs> but just being from America isn't good enough. Cars had to actually be good to sell. And if you don't sell, you don't make money. And if you don't make money, then you die. <laughs> Our first victim of 21st century automotive economics was the rock that we didn't land on, it landed on us, Plymouth. My Plymouth. Plymouth. <laughs> Plymouth started in 1928 as a way for Chrysler to compete with low cost alternative from Detroit's other automakers. And its affordability actually helped Chrysler pull through the Great Depression. If you or a car company that you know is going through a depression, great or otherwise, you aren't alone. Email Nolan at Mrs. Harry Styles at donutmedia.com. We're here to help. Yeah. But it wasn't until 1955 that Plymouth started making cool cars for us to remember, like the Fury. Named after the Bradley Pitt Shire LeBruff movie. Those early models came with a 5.2 liter V8 engine making 290 horsepower, which was pretty decent back then. And it came in tons of different body styles to make it appealing to everyone from hot rodders to housewives to house rodders to hot wives. After that, Plymouth doubled down and became a real muscle car brand with classics like the Barracuda and the Superbird, which won a lot of NASCAR races. Like so many freaking NASCAR races, you won't even believe. Why don't, uh, why don't car manufacturers nowadays just make the same thing, call it the same thing in different versions, right? Don't they? Things were going well for Plymouth until the 1990s when they started badge engineering their cars. Basically, that means they just started pulling parts and design cues from other Chrysler models and putting Plymouth badges on it. It's like buying uh, real name brand wheel plates uh -huh. and putting them on knockoffs. Right. So once the company starts doing that, it's pretty much game over, baby. Kills everything that made those cars unique. Is that a Plymouth Laser? I don't know, is it an Eagle Talon? Mitsubishi Eclipse? Nobody knows. As the 2000s got closer, Plymouth tried a few different brand pivots to get a better sense of its own identity. And it had one more trick up its sleeve. This was going to be the thing that saved the entire company. It was Chip Foose, the guy that, you know, did overhaul in. It was a Chip Foose designed open wheel roadster with big gray bumpers and a tiny little V6. Of course, we're talking about the hot rod inspired Plymouth Prowler, one of the best cars to ever be named after a creepy guy. <laughs> Prowler. Prowler. <laughs> Plymouth had dumped tons of money into this thing, hoping that it would be the kind of retro modern classic that would save the company from its misery. Instead, Plymouth made a unique looking car with a goofy automatic V6. It was soft. <laughs> and only old people liked it. Like tapioca pudding. It also cost over $70,000 in today's money. <laughs> oh God. All that in an era of sports cars like the C5 Corvette and the Honda NSX, the Prowler never stood a chance. Never stood a chance. All right, so the Prowler wasn't Plymouth's only flop either. Some of its last cars on the market were boring sedans like the Breeze, Ugh. which is named after a wimpy wind. And uh, the PT Cruiser, which is named after the director of Boogie Nights for some reason. It's a P.T. Anderson joke, you guys. <laughs> so on June 28th, 2001, Plymouth's last car rolled off the production line and nothing else bad happened for the rest of that year. We're talking about Oldsmobile. Oldsmobile had been in business since the early 1900s before it was bought out by GM in 1908. Which is still the early 1900s. Yeah, but back then Oldsmobile was synonymous for innovation, power, and adventure. Just like Justin built for it. I'm talking about cars like the lightweight 1949 Rocket 88 with this big old V8 engine, which was super popular in NASCAR and might be the actual first real muscle car. Yeah, and the Starfire, which introduced the automatic 
Transmission to America. Boom. Te technology. <laughs> uh, and the surprisingly sporty Cutlass. But like the early 90s, just like a bowl full of those candies that look like a strawberry and they got the jelly in them. And they never go stale. They never go stale. But <laughs> unlike that, Oldsmobile did get stale. The image problem was one thing, especially when you could get better, more reliable cars like the Nissan Altima and the Honda Accord. Not even the Alero could save the brand because <laughs> that's another great name. It sounds <laughs> like a fiber cereal. <laughs> You yes. take your Alero. Or, or yeah. medicine. Yeah, ask your doctor if Alero is right for you. <laughs> uh, Olds phased out most of his models before it was killed off, and the final Alero rolled off the production line in 2004. Then something happened that we're still feeling the repercussions of today. I'm talking about the 2008 financial crisis. This is everything that you need to know to get up to speed on that. Some dumb money people messed around with money in a dumb way and it left 9 million people without jobs and a bunch of people lost their houses. And as you can imagine, not a lot of people were buying cars at this time. At all. At all. Now by the end of 2008, GM and Chrysler were weeks away from collapse and to prevent even greater economic devastation, the government bailed them out to save an estimated one million jobs. But that meant GM and Chrysler had to make some sacrifices and cut a lot of their fat. And by fat, I mean iconic car brands. All right, let's start with Pontiac. Pontiac started in 1926 and was designed to be a step up from entry level Chevy models, like a more luxurious brand. But then it transformed into a performance division in the 1960s. Thanks, John DeLorean. Yeah, it's basically John DeLorean. Throughout Pontiac's history, we saw icons like the Pontiac Bonneville, the Trans Am, the GTO, the Firebird, all of which became legends of the American muscle car era. And then Pontiac started to get a little weird. In the 1990s and 2000s, they took big swings with cars like the Pontiac Aztec and the Solstice, while they phased out more iconic models like the Firebird. This is the best condition Pontiac Solstice we could find. Yeah. <laughs> so that we can rent it. And it is the horrible spec automatic in a, but it does have 18 inch wheels, which, you know, feel pretty good in the steering. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's kind of peppy, honestly. Hey, dude, this is a pure sports car experience. Yeah. One of the last pure sports cars, Pontiac Solstice, convertible, rear wheel drive, yep. uh, comes in a manual, got big old wheels. Four cylinder, four cylinder turbo. Four cylinder or four cylinder turbo. Um, yeah. Ryan Turk drove one of these in FD. Red Bull sponsored one for Ryan Turk back in FD. They actually perform really well for a little short wheelbase cars. So what happened? Why is this car not here? And why is Pontiac dead? Well, when the financial crisis hit, GM originally stated that it would retain Pontiac, but trim down its lineup to niche models that would appeal to a younger audience. They lied. They lied. And they killed it in order to secure financial backing from Congress, selling off all of its inventory and saying that Pontiac was not for sale. The last Pontiac, a G6, left the assembly line in January of 2010 now it's in hell. Probably still only worth six grand. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure you're asking, what about some of GM's other brands? They had to be worth keeping, right? Uh -huh. In an era of fuel efficient cars, something like Saturn should be surviving, thriving, right? It's named after a freaking planet. Just like Tesla. Is it? <laughs> Tesla's a person. Saturn was GM's <laughs> attempt to offer a domestic counterpart to all the Japanese imports that had skyrocketed in popularity. GM started Saturn in 1985 and its employee owned structure made it pretty different from all the other GM brands. That independence enabled Saturn to develop dent resistant polymer exterior panels, i.e. Plastic. Plastic car. The Saturn Ion with dent resistant side panels. In its lifetime, Saturn basically had two fun cars, the Sky and the Ion Redline. That was it. 
and they're both based off of other GM products. Yeah, they're both so other GM products. They weren't really original. They look kind of cool. And then GM had to kill Saturn to avoid bankruptcy yet again. And it tried to sell Saturn to Penske, you know, the rental truck brand, mm -hmm. but the deal fell through because Penske could not find a way to actually build the cars. That's one thing that you definitely need if you're gonna run a car company. Yeah, if you're gonna sell cars, you gotta be able to build them. Yeah. You can't just sell sketches. It's maybe. economics 101. <laughs> By the end of 2010, GM devoured Saturn, just like he had done to his son, who now remains in hell. He just referenced this painting. Mm -hmm. It's called Saturn Devours His Son. Maybe try crack books sometime. Yeah. All right, so Hummer was always a bit of a different breed. GM bought the military Humvee line from AM General in an effort to produce the beefy civilian models that people like Arnold Schwarzenegger wanted so bad. GM bought the name in 1999, and it mostly focused on marketing and distributing street versions of the OG H1s made by AM General. It's all a money grab. Yeah, it's a freaking cash grab. But Hummer's timing just wasn't right. The H2 and H3 models were huge and a little goofy. They sucked up gasoline like it was a freaking milkshake. You know, those ones that are hard to get at McDonald's. Something that Americans loved until gas prices got crazy in 2003. Sucking up gas like it's a milkshake. Sucking up gas like it's a milkshake. When the financial crisis hit in 2008, GM had already been talking about selling Hummer. In 2009, it seemed like GM had struck a deal with a Chinese company as part of its larger bankruptcy settlement, but that deal collapsed when it became clear that Hummer would never actually meet Chinese regulations. GM's last option was to kill off the entire Hummer line in 2010. But the name Hummer is back, and now it doesn't suck up gas like a milkshake. <laughs> it doesn't suck gas at all. It's electric now. Just like the freaking Terminator, all right? Humvee wasn't GM's last sob story. The last sob story for GM would be the sob story. S-A-A-B. GM bought Saab in 1990, but it was originally founded back in 1945. Its best-selling model, the Saab 900, launched in the late 1970s, and under GM's ownership, it developed the 9.3 and introduced the badge-engineered 9.2X and 9.7X. 9.2X, based on a Subaru. The Sabaru. It was clear that Saab just really wasn't working for GM by 2007, and the parent company was talking about selling it at that point. They pulled back its support, and Saab essentially went bankrupt. Saab was the only brand that GM actually sold. In 2010, Dutch supercar brand Spiker actually bought it, and it had already started to go downhill. <laughs> GM blocked the sale to a group of Chinese buyers in 2011, so Saab petitioned for bankruptcy just before it was sold to a brand new company called National Electric Vehicle Sweden. Then it lost the license to manufacture Saabs and died in 2016. We still got other companies that were in the red. Like, red like. Blood. The blood of your enemies. Blood of your enemies. <laughs> Ford was the only company from Detroit's Big Three that didn't accept government assistance in 2008. And that is because two years earlier, in 2006, Ford mortgaged all their company's assets for billions of dollars, took out a bunch of loans that they used for a massive overhaul. It seemed like a desperate move at the time, but it meant that Ford was able to exist as an independently operating entity after the financial crisis. They still lost money, but didn't have to rely on the government handouts, which worked for them politically very well. Yeah. And that partly came down to public perception. Car buyers were absolutely stoked to buy from a brand that didn't have to get bailed out. One that had already been focusing on consolidating, re-envisioning, and refining its lineup. The cars cost a little bit more than GM or Chrysler's, but buyers showed that they were willing to invest in a company that reflected their actual values. Ford did have to sacrifice one little thing though. Mercury. Mercury. The planet. The planet. Another planet, gone. <laughs> Blew it up. All right, so Mercury was originally designed to fall somewhere in between Ford and Cadillac in terms of fanciness and price. And its integrated bodies like the 9CM that James Dean drove in Rebel Without a Cause were huge with hot rodders in the 1950s. You ever heard of a lead sled? That's a Merc. And after years of borrowing body designs from other cars, Mercury started to distance itself in the 1960s and 70s with the Cougar. Yeah. Yeah, we love the Cougar. Rawr. Rawr. And the Cougar filled the gap between the basic Mustang and the luxurious Thunderbird. In the 1980s, the Grand Marquis, which is named after a place where the names go at the top of a the theater, and the Sable, 
which is named after a ferret, <laughs> uh, headed into the lineup. A literal slew of full brand redesigns in the 1990s helped keep Mercury in the market, but it was obvious by the turn of the century that the brand was struggling to get attention from literally anyone who wasn't shoving tapioca pudding into their toothless mouth hole. Mercury started getting rid of cars and different model lines, and basically all they kept were four things with a Mercury badge on it. And in 2010, Ford killed it like an old dog on a farm. Get out of here. Get. <laughs> I don't want you no more, Mercury. All right, even Toyota makes mistakes. I am, of course, talking about Scion. Since the brand was introduced in 2002, Scion's whole shtick was to appeal to young people by building cheaper cars that looked like MTV, make them easy to buy, and let you customize them from a catalog at the dealership. Young people love individuality, and they love catalogs. Just, I, man, I hmm, can't get enough of them. The FRS is obviously cool because they're still making a version of it today, mm -hmm. but what about the rest of the Scions? You know who liked them? DJs? And guess what? Old, Old people. people! Sales started falling in 2007 when Scion lost a quarter of its customers. By 2010, it had lost a further 70%. As a result, Toyota killed off Scion in 2017. Some of its models like the IA or IM lived on in Toyota form. Others like the XB were sent across the rainbow bridge. And now they live in hell. Thanks for watching this video and everything else on Donut. Hit that subscribe button to make sure you don't miss anything. Go to donutmedia.com. We make a bunch of different clothes and accessories and stuff. I really like that. Uh, follow Justin at Justin Freeman. Follow me at James Pumphrey. We're There's racing a, an airplane. We're racing an airplane. <laughs> oh, yeah. Bye. Have a good one. <laughs>